Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Florence Williams to discuss Heartbreak, a personal and scientific journey published by our friends at Norton and Company. Heartbreak is a remarkable merging of science and self-discovery that will change the way we think about loneliness, health, and what it means to fall in and out of love. Florence Williams is the author of Breasts, winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and The Nature Fix. A contributing editor at Outside Magazine, her writing has appeared in the New York Times, National Geographic, and many other outlets. To moderate this evening's conversation, we're joined by Helen Fisher, PhD, a biological anthropologist and a senior research fellow at the Kinsey Institute and chief science advisor to the internet dating site Match.com. She has conducted extensive research and written six books on the evolution and future of human sex, love, marriage, gender differences in the brain, and how your personality style shapes who you are and who you love. Just a quick reminder that throughout this evening's broadcast, you can post your questions below in the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. And please order your copy of Heartbreak from Books and Books below and support independent bookstores. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest to the virtual stage. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Are we starting? Yeah, we're starting. Oh, Florence, you. Know, I'll, I'll just say a very uh, brief thing about you. First of all, all the people who are listening, this really is a good book. Nobody's paying me to say that. This is a very interesting book. In the back, I wrote the blurb, and I ended up saying it was just a, a fascinating book. But, I mean, I've studied love for over 40 years, and I was taking notes. And I started reading it again today, and I'm taking notes again. And the reason is, not only does do, do you, Florence, really capture the heartache of romantic love uh, uh, when you're broken up, but also all of the science that you did. I mean, really, I mean, going and understanding what's going on with your immune system and certainly my stuff with the brain. So I'll just say one thing about me and then start in on Florence. The reason Florence came to me to inter interview me is because I and my colleagues have put over 100 people into a brain scanner and studied the brain circuitry of romantic love. People who are happily in love, people who are rejected in love, and people who are in love long term. So, um, and so she was going through this breakup. Uh, we were out at the Aspen Institute. She invited me to to um, uh, uh, talk with her, and it turned into a great friendship and a great book. So, Florence, I mean, uh, uh, how would you like to begin? Well, I would love to just set the stage for that as well, Helen, because when I met you um, at the Aspen Institute conference, I was only, I think, five or six weeks out from my husband moving out from the split. And I was a total wreck. And I found out you were there. I had read some of your books. I knew that you had done some of this research. And I just sent you an email and I said, I'm having a terrible time, I think, or can, can I talk to you about what's going on in my brain? And you said, sure, kiddo, come on over. I'm in room 135 or something. Um, you couldn't have been nicer. You know, you had no idea who I was. Um, and I turned on the tape machine <laughs> and you got me a drink of water and we sat on the couch and we crossed our legs. And you you said to me, you said, are you are you sleeping? And I said, no. And you said, are you eating? And I said, I don't think so. I'm losing all this weight. And you said, I can tell you exactly what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, some it, was of it. Really it was just like, it was just what I needed. And then you did, you explained to me why I felt so terrible and what was happening in my brain. Yeah. And, um, that was the start of, of, a, of, an, of a really nice working relationship and a nice friendship. And I'm so grateful because it really did launch the inquiry that became this book. It's so interesting because I think that it really helps people to understand what is going on with them. You know, um, I mean, they're not crazy. I mean, this has made them crazy, that's for sure. 
Yeah. Um, and I mean, you know, we 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 live for love, we pine for love, we kill for love, and we die for love. And Florence, I know that you lost 20 pounds. When a guy dumped me, I lost 20 pounds. I remember sitting at my desk and I could look, you know, because I often eat at my desk. I saw breakfast, lunch, and dinner piled <laughs> up next to me on this desk. I didn't even notice it. I mean, it's unbelievable. You know, it's so remarkable why we suffer so badly. But just just for you, what what if how are you right now? I'm great, actually. Um, I'm. Uh, it, this is almost five years later mm -hmm. now, and um, I'm sleeping again. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm. Uh, I've gained most of the weight back. I ended up getting diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. My body really started breaking down after the breakup, and um, that was part of what stunned me and surprised me, and why I felt like a book needed to be written because I felt like people understood the art of heartbreak, yeah. but they didn't really understand the science of it. I didn't know about the science of it. Um, I was so baffled by why I was getting sick, mm -hmm. um, having never really experienced that before. And as you told me as well, there, there just wasn't that much even science about it. It was a lot of new research. I mean, you had been one of the few people who'd actually looked at the brains of people rejected in love. And I mean, what even inspired you to do that, Helen? Because y you were unusual in the field. Yeah, I, I think we're the first people that did it. I, I, you know, well, first of all, my first academic paper on this, um, you know, I wrote and one of the four uh, reviewers wrote back and he said, you can't study this. This is part of the supernatural. Love is part of the supernatural. <laughs> and I thought to myself, hang on here. I mean, anger's not part of the supernatural. Fear's not part of the supernatural. People die over this thing. I mean, the the myths, the legends, the symphonies, the plays, the ballets, the operas, the movies, the books, the therapists, the holidays, the emojis. I mean, come <laughs> on, man. We, you know, this is a this is we're saturated in this world of romantic love and rejection and love. And so I thought it's really valuable study to study this. And I had decided to put people who are happily in love into the brain scanner. And we got a lot of world attention for that because we were first in, in the world doing that. And after that, I thought to myself, you know, this isn't really very important. I mean, who cares about people who are happily in love? It's the people who are rejected in love that you know are dangerous to themselves and often dangerous to others, and so that's what what, what really me drove, drove me. I regard that as uh, one of the one of the two most important things I've done with my life is is understanding rejection and love, and and it helped you. Why did it help you to know about this stuff? Well, it was so validating, first of all, because you said you know even though Florence, you have never experienced this before, and you're stunned and surprised by it, it is universal. You know, none of, I think the words you said was n nobody gets out of love alive. <laughs> yes. right? we, yeah. we all get hurt. And, and you were very reassuring and validating. And, and you said, you know, you will get through it, but it is, you said it is one of the worst kinds of pain that humans can suffer. Right. Um, it's, and, you know, and psychologists have long ranked it as kind of the second most stressful thing you can experience after the death of a spouse. And yet, it's so under-researched. It's so kind of under-discussed. We don't ritualize it as a culture. Um, there's a lot of shame and there's a lot of stigma around it. There's a lot of very uncomfortable feelings, especially if you're dealing with rejection, um, if you're if you're dealing with um, rage. You know, the, these aren't sort of culturally sanctioned emotions that we're comfortable talking about. Yeah. And so the fact that you were so validating and helpful and you said there are scientific reasons you're feeling this way, um, you're a human mammal. We're not supposed to be alone. You know, our attachments are what our brains are built for. And when those attachments fail, it's no wonder that our nervous systems completely freak out as if we were left alone and abandoned on the savanna. It's our yeah. brain makes no distinction. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting because I, 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 as I was writing my various books about it, I thought to myself, why do we suffer so much? I mean, I can see the personal suffering of abandonment being stuck on the grass that's by yourself. But the bottom line is not only have you lost your daily habits, um, but you may have lost uh, certainly a partner, maybe children, maybe uh, your home, uh, certainly money. 
Well, maybe your neighbors, maybe your car, maybe the cat and the dog. Uh, you know, what are you going to be doing at Christmas or Hanukkah? Or, you know, your your patterns of, of life are gone. But and then I began to think, well, it's more even more than that, the, the loneliness and the, the loss of all the things around you. But also, um, you know, if you are madly in love with somebody who has rejected you before you marry, uh, you've lost the ability to maybe have babies with these this person and send your DNA into tomorrow. And in your case, you already had two children. So what you were losing was a partner to help you raise those babies. So we're not only socially and personally jeopardized, but we are biologically jeopardized. You know, I mean, um, threatened at the most primary level of human experience which is living on through yourself, passing your DNA on to tomorrow. So no wonder uh, we, we struggle as much as we do, uh, you know. So, um, but what I loved, I loved all the parts of your book. <laughs> I started reading it again today and I just thought it was just, just wonderful. But um, of course, all the parts, I didn't know a lot of the stuff about the immune system. Tell, tell about the immune, and by the way, are you through? Have you gotten back? Is your health back to normal? I mean, do you? Yeah, I mean, so I I ended up, you know, uh, in the ER uh, during, you know, after the split, I ended up in the ER with um, really high blood sugar. I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, which is type one diabetes. I was diagnosed as an adult, which is relatively un unusual. Um, and diabetes isn't really a reversible type one. It's not really a reversible condition. It's sort of progressive. And so, um, I still have it, but I have stabilized it. Um, I'm not at the moment getting worse. I'm, I'm managing it actually really well. Um, Does you think this triggered it? I mean, nobody noticed this before. <laughs> No, you know, no, it's impossible, I think, for one individual to say what causes a cancer or a disease, right? It's it's right. very hard to make that cause and effect. But if we look at, you know, the population studies and we look at the data, we know that people who are divorced have a higher incidence of diabetes. They have a higher incidence of early death. They have a higher incidence of dementia, of Alzheimer's, of metastatic cancer. Their immune systems are different. Um, we know one psychologist told me that divorce, the story of divorce is a story of inflammation. Mm. Oh, wow. And I thought that is a story that hasn't been told. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a story that I want to tell. And it was deeply, deeply personal and relevant to my sort of existence at that time. So mm -hmm. I ended up talking to um, Stephen Cole at UCLA, who has made it his life's work to analyze the genetic markers, the transcription factors of people who consider themselves lonely to ask, why is it that lonely people get sicker? Why is it that lonely people die younger? Uh, and he, he invited me to his lab. He said, why don't you come into the lab? We'll analyze your blood. We'll see if you have the blood of a lonely person. Did now, you? Yes, mm -hmm. I did. And what kind of the white blood cells for the immune system or? Uh... Yes. So so what he looks at are, are, is the suite of about 200 genes. Mm -hmm. uh, and he analyzes the signatures, the transcription factors that upregulate genes for inflammation and downregulate at the same time because the immune system can't do everything. So if you're upregulating inflammation because your body is literally preparing to be attacked by a predator because you feel alone on the savanna, yeah. it's downregulating the genes for virus fighting. Yeah. And you know, lo and behold, here we were, you know, heading into a pandemic, and um, the genes of lonely people are actually worse able to fend off um, viruses. And through his work, he's found out um, viruses like HIV, um, and um, you know, presumably um, COVID as well, coronavirus. Yeah. You know, I had read that uh, people who are, are very lonely and, and isolated, it's worse than uh, diabetes, lack of exercise, uh, to you know, bad diet, um, uh, smoking, yeah. uh, and, and various other addictions. I mean, and, you, and and I think you really hit the head. You really got it right then when you said, when you brought it back to the grasslands of Africa, that, you know, on the grasslands of Africa, a person who was alone was going to die. I yeah. mean, we are a group animal. We're and not supposed to be alone. Yeah, we're not supposed to be alone. And it's very, well, for any period of time, you know. Right. I mean, and and we can do it and people can do it happily. 
But your nervous system is definitely going to be hype, a little hyper vigilant, especially if you're not used to being alone, and okay. especially if you're feeling freaked out about it. Yeah. Um, which I was because I had been with the same man for 32 years, wow. never been alone as an mm -hmm. adult. Um, I, I was so desperate to find role models. And, um, you know, Helen, frankly, you also appeared to me as this kind of vision of um, togetherness <laughs> because, you know, you, at the time I met you, you, you were single um, and you were thriving and you were financially secure. And um, I just thought, okay, I, I, I didn't know enough. I didn't have enough friends like you. Most of my friends were still in these 20 year marriages. Um, mm -hmm. In my demographic, people don't divorce anymore. It's very unusual, 15%. Yeah. So um, it's not what it was in 1980 when, you know, we heard all about half of all marriages ending. It doesn't, it doesn't happen that way anymore. You know, it's so interesting because, I mean, I was definitely single, but I've just about always had a boyfriend or been looking for one. <laughs> you, well, know, I, you know, I call you the goddess of love. Yeah, no, I, I, I like I like being with the man and other people can like whoever they want to be with. But the bottom line is you just feel better. You know, I mean, you're so right. I mean, people who are in good, a positive relationships, I live, what, five to seven years longer, um, you know, with the hugs they get, they drives up the oxytocin system and calms you and feels it gives you feelings of attachment. You know, when you laugh with somebody, it drives up dopamine, gives you optimism and energy and focus and motivation. And and when you play with somebody, it really creates a brain growth. We were built to love. We were just built to love. And when that is taken away, and of course, you captured it absolutely perfectly uh, in, in your book. There's something I went, really was amazed. I was reading this again today, and I just was so fascinated with something because you're a real rugged individual. I mean, you're a girl who... Or actually thinks. And I really appreciated this particular little thing. Um, I came to dismiss some of the conventional approaches to recovering from rupture, especially the idea that you shouldn't form other attachments too quickly, and that the key to healing is the commonly traded bromide of loving yourself first. Now, I have always, I don't know if you still believe those, but I never figured out why people would think you got to love yourself first. It seems to be so saturated with psychology. I don't see the other. It's nice to love yourself. I'm all for that. And I do think that people are attracted to people who are happy and who, who, who people who have self-confidence. But if you're people, for somebody like me, I'm not crazy about myself or crazy. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a fool. Who, who not is fully healed, right? I'm because a happy person. And do you still agree with those two things that, yeah, that, I do still agree. And in fact, um, a hard headed, smart girl. <laughs> it's, it's another reason I love meeting you, Helen, because right away you said you said to me, oh, Florence, you know, you're too young to go without falling in love again. Like you're going to find someone again. You're going to fall in love again. Um, you know, love is still in your future. And I wasn't ready to hear that at the time. I was still very much, um, you know, not really imagining that and, and in, in my place of pain. But I did yeah, want to I, ask, so I don't do that again. Did, did you you didn't want to hear it or you just couldn't hear the hope? No, I just wasn't hope. ready. I wasn't ready to sort of go out and, you know, find husband number two, uh, you know, and I'm still not even sure, you know, that that's got to be the solution to heartbreak. You know, I think that there are a lot of ways, as you know, a lot of ways to love, a lot of ways to be loved. Um, and, and romantic love is, is wonderful and fun, but, but there are other ways, you know, to express love and to feel love. But I, I also wanted to know where the science was behind that advice. You know, don't jump into another relationship too soon. I was like, well, where's the science in that? And in fact, there, there, I couldn't find any. And there was science indicating the opposite, that people who have a rebound relationship relatively quickly um, feel more self-confidence. They feel greater self-esteem. They can attach um, sooner from their ex. Um, so, so that was one of the, you know, sort of things I wanted. One of the myths that I wanted to kind of take on and debunk in this book. And the idea of loving yourself first is a nice idea, but, but you're never going to be perfect and ready for a partner. And in fact, you can grow right in the context of but, being in a supportive relationship. Yeah. So um, 
I think so many people may be kind of intimidated about finding love if they feel like they're not perfect. And of course, that's a huge bar to intimacy. Um, in intimacy, you're supposed to be able to present your imperfect selves. And that's something I think I learned late in the game, but um, did learn through the course of writing this book. Uh, repeat that last part, that, that, that you learned that you can be imperfect and be loved and to love. Yes. And then in fact, you know, it's our flaws. It's our flaws that enable us to see each other authentically. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because I'm this chief science advisor to Match.com. We do this annual study called Singles in America. We do not poll the Match members. We poll the American public. I've got the data now on 55,000 Americans. And one year, I, I create about 200 questions every year. We, po we, we go poll them out. It's a national representative sam uh, sample of singles based on the U.S. Census. So it's real science. And one year I asked singles, what, um, what's keeping you from, um, from, you know, entering into a relationship? And uh, one of the things, 40% said, first, I want um, self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, man, it's nice. Oh, that. <laughs> it's nice. Like, give, us, give yourself a break, man. You know, I mean, come on here. I mean, I'm 76, for Christ's sake, self-acceptance. So I still say stupid things and go stupid places, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, I just think it's so, you know, love is such a, it's such an, it's a, it's a brain system. You know, it, it's a very natural habit, pattern, drive. It's a drive. That's what I've been able to prove that it's a drive. And, uh, and so I, you know, I, 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 I think that people are too hard on themselves. I think they've analyzed it sometimes too much. Um, one thing that I found was very interesting, and I'm sure you went through this, you know, when we put the people who are rejected in the machine, we found activity in this brain region linked with romantic love. We found activity in this brain region linked with feelings of attachment. We found activity in that brain region linked with physical pain, which you talk about. And we found activity in three brain regions linked with craving and addiction. But what I wanted to mention is that a, there's one area um, that it has to do with craving and addiction, but it's also associated in the science literature with trying to figure out your gains and your losses. Mm -hmm. What have you gained? What have you lost? Yeah. And, um, you know, and you, you, you lie in bed and sort of figure out what, what you've gained and lost. And I, and one of the things that was very sweet, you, you say it in your book, there was one guy that dumped me and I, I never could figure it out. I never could figure out why he dumped me. And I finally said to myself, you know what, Helen, make it up, make up a story so that then you can get rid of it. Is that what you do? I mean, you know all about yours. Yeah. You know, get, yeah. The gains well, and the losses and destroy. Did you, you finally got rid of it, right? <laughs> but when you said that to me, I also, I couldn't do it, you know, at that moment. I, I, I was so confused and still stunned about the marriage ending. I, I couldn't really imagine. I couldn't figure out exactly what had gone wrong. I couldn't figure out what my story was, not only the reason for why it ended, but I couldn't figure out what my story was going to be moving forward. You know, who was I as this sort of um, heroine of my life? I didn't, <laughs> well said. I didn't know who, I, who that person was going to be. Um, and, and maybe it's because I had met him when I was 18. I had never, um, you know, existed outside of the context of that marriage. And so uh, I had to do so much self-discovery to kind of write the story because I didn't know who, who was going to be the narrator. You know, I didn't know who she was yet. But, but what you said stuck with me along the whole journey. And we know from the science and the psychology of sort of resilience that storytelling, right, and, and creating the story, creating the narrative is incredibly important in terms of how you frame what happened to you mm -hmm. and how you frame how you're going to move into the future. So I came back to what you had said all the time. And, it, you know, it was it did not happen quickly for me. It was a slow, very slow journey to figure out who I was going to be and and what that was going to look like. And what did you do with the story once you've gotten it figured out? I have actually clung on to it. I've clung to it. I know you said, you said once you create that story and it serves you, then you can sort of let it go. But I am still holding on to my story. I, I think it still provides a kind of compass for me 
Oh, um, nice. That's nice. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it, what, worry, what part of the story uh, uh, helps you? Yeah. With I, people will, will really be interested in this. Well, I think the story I tell myself is that I'm someone who was able to survive, that I'm a survivor. And I didn't know that about myself, you know, early on because I had never gone through this before. Um, and I told myself I'm someone who has grown from this experience, that I'm changed for the better. Mm -hmm. that I have become, grown and in what way are you for the better? Um, I would say, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and part of it was, you know, from talking to psychologists who talk about this idea of post-traumatic growth, you know, yeah. that after a tragedy, we can come out of it having learned more about ourselves right. and learning more about each other. And so that is the story I tell myself that I've come through this stronger that having, ironically, having gone through a broken heart, I feel like my heart is more capable of love mm. than it was before. That I know more about how to sit with uncomfortable emotions. I know more about how to experience joy and beauty along with the really difficult emotions, that there's this range and it's not all bad. Once your heart cracks open and you lose your sort of defenses that you're used to having up around you, um, then the world sort of opens up in terms of possibility. And so the story I tell myself is that I have kind of seized some of those possibilities and I am a, I show up better for the people I love, that I'm a better listener, that I'm more empathetic. You sure you're not being too hard on yourself? I didn't see lack of agency and lack of ability to listen when I first met you. So I would just wonder whether you got a good news story going. No, I'm much, I'm much more empathetic than I was because I was someone who was just in this bubble wrap of privilege, you know, and mar a long marriage provides that kind of bubble wrap. Um, I, I, you know, the world is really set up for these long married couples. You don't even know it until you're not in one anymore. Sort of what a state of privilege that is. Um, and, and I feel much, much more empathetic now toward people who have struggled. You know, it's on the reverse. I, and I have always been single and getting married last year. Congratulations. Suddenly, thank you. Um, uh, we're calling it the endless honeymoon. Um, I, I finally understand the world that you lived in for so long. You know, I've always understood the sex drive. I've always understood romantic love. I've been there many times. I've lived with people, but I never married one, you know, until last year at age 75, as I mentioned. And the bottom line is I finally get what you lost. Right. I really do. It's amazing how I, I I look at every man's wedding ring now and I think, oh, wow, there's a there's a couple there. There's another person there. I can't see her. I haven't met her. But there's this another person there and he's wearing her, you know, on his finger and she's wearing him. I finally get attachment at this age, having written all these books and studying love for, what, 45 years or whatever. I finally asked my husband, I said, why is marriage different? And he said, it's richer and deeper. Well, uh, but not, so, I mean, you're, you're, in an end, you're in an endless honeymoon <laughs> and you're very lucky because I actually think most marriages are not so happy. I mean, we know from the research that 50% of marriages are kind of what they consider so-so marriages mm -hmm. and they don't have the same health benefits and they don't have the same richness as the, the special lucky ones, like the one that you have found. And so I struggle with this a lot. You know, um, there are so many health, there are so many health problems associated with divorce. There are health problems associated with being in a bad marriage. Um, you know, at what point, you know, should people be saying, maybe this isn't working for me. Maybe this isn't working for my health. And, and, and also the other, the other, I think really salient point is that the health benefits of marriage are not evenly distributed. So we know that men have a much greater boost than women do from being married. Right. And the women sometimes end up taking care of the men. <laughs> so, right. so I, I think it's, it's a really complicated story about how to form the attachments that are going to be enriching. Right. 
Well, the beauty uh, of today is you can walk out of something, you know, as Confucius said, the way out is through the door. And in fact, you know, there's some people who should take the way out because the marriage is so much more detrimental. I remember so many times I would look in the mirror as I was brushing my teeth at night. I was thinking, well, I seem, I must seem to be alone, but I'm not in a bad marriage. And that's probably worse. And the beauty of, I mean, you know, it's so, so interesting how everybody says that the biggest new thing in the world is technology. Well, guess what? Technology is just enabling us to do the same old thing a whole lot faster. I mean, we're talking here now, it's a lot faster. I can email you, it's a lot faster than walking 100 miles on the grasslands of Africa to see you in the next <laughs> in the gathering group. But the really huge modern trend is women piling into the job market in cultures around the world. And the rise of the double income family, the rise of women's education, the ability of women to and men to walk out of something that doesn't work in order to make something that does work. And I just think that's a that's a real blessing. I got to ask you a question. I've got a lot of questions, but this one is um, I should maybe wait till the end. But what is your husband? What does your former husband think of your book and the fact that you were, you know, so much national media, uh, such a brilliant writer, uh, such an exquisite uh, manuscript that really and you know, you're very nice to him. You never describe your anger at him. You don't talk about your anger. You talk about your own suffering. But what did happen to that guy? <laughs> well, I mean, that was, is he suffering from seeing all this going on and seeing? Yeah, I, honestly, I think, he, I think, yeah, he is. I mean, he's a very private person. I think he feels embarrassed, you know, by the way the marriage ended, um, at which I only described a tiny, the tiniest bit of. Um, and I think he's hard on himself for that. I think he feels badly for it. Um, and I think he would prefer, you know, to just go quietly into the night at this point. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that those are not my instincts. My instincts are to storytell and to seek, um, you know, to sort of disclose and to seek comfort and healing, you know, through sh sharing stories. Um, but that said, um, he understands why I needed to write this book. And I think he understands why it will help a lot of people. Yeah, um, it's going to help a lot of people. And that's and important. You know, you really are in the helping profession at this point. <laughs> um, what of all of the um, things that you learned about the brain and, and your body has been most helpful to you? Ooh, good question. Um, Well, I think we need to take our emotions really seriously. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be more emotionally intelligent. That's kind of one of the big lessons I got out of this. Um, I think for so long, I I really lived in a very narrow emotional range. And part of that is because I was in a marriage that wasn't always great. And it was easier not to feel, not to feel the hurts and the small resentments. Um, and ultimately, I think, you know, that was that was not so healthy. That yeah. probably wasn't healthy either. And so one of the biggest lessons for me is that it's okay to have negative emotions. Mm -hmm. It's okay to sit with things that are uncomfortable and uncertain. Um, I've learned so many more tools about how to sit more comfortably with those emotions, such as through meditation, such as through, you know, being in nature, such as through being with my friends and having authentic, you know, big talks. Mm -hmm. um, my girlfriends and I and I know women are especially good at that. You know that sort of attending and befriending. Right. Um, I think men after divorce sometimes have, have a much harder time. Oh, sure, um, they do. they're too, apparently two and a half times more likely to kill themselves. But uh, uh, you know that that's not my data. It's so very interesting because I think there's another uh, part to this. You know, um, I talk in my various stuff about the uh, stuff about the fact that you know there's a huge brain region linked with negativity bias. We're mm -hmm. built to remember the negative, right? And, you know, and for millions of years, it was adaptive. I mean, so I mean, it's nice to remember who your friends are, but if you forget who hates you, you could die. So we remember the negative. I mean, you'll go to a party, everybody's very nice and all this stuff, and one person turns to you and says, "Have you gained a little weight?" What is it? We go home. You only remember that. But when you're madly in love with somebody, uh, activity in that brain region reduces, and it's called positive illusions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I do in my life is 
when I find something that I do find somewhat annoying, um, I'll say, okay, he did this, but he's also hilariously funny, very kind, very competent, very uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's almost like a tool uh, that I use, you know. And so what you're saying, let's say you're saying meditation, um, um, uh, friendships, uh, probably I would suggest, I mean, I think you should train, uh, treat it as an addiction. I mean, we've been able to prove that the addiction centers in the brain do become activated. Exactly the same brain regions that become activated when a substance addiction, anything from heroin to, you know, nicotine and the behavioral addictions, something like gambling, et cetera. So the brain, romantic love is an addiction, a perfectly wonderful addiction when it's going well and yeah. a perfectly disastrous one when it's going poorly. So I would even say, you know, get rid of the cards and letters. Don't write, don't call. I mean, if you're going to give up drinking, you don't keep a bottle of tequila on your desk. The same way you got to get rid of all these things. And the problem is, you know, it's nice to talk about it and formulate your story and all that. But after a while, you're just raising the ghost. You know, right. every time you're talking, I remember when I was dubbed it, my friends were being very polite to ask me, oh, Helen, how are you feeling? And after a while, I said, you know, I don't want to talk about it anymore. All it does is remind me. Yeah. Yeah. Of him. It's yeah. time to go out, get some exercise, stop eating this sugar, get, get new friends, you know, novelty, 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 drives up dopamine, gets you going in a different direction. And you did that. You went on all kinds of, of you know, outdoors, uh, uh, you know, events and things. Tell a little bit about how you self-soothed. Well, one of the critical conversations I had early on was with Paula Williams, who's a psychologist at the University of Utah. And she said to me, yes, we know divorce is terrible for your health. It's terrible for your stress levels. But some people are more resilient than others. And these are the people who are able to really engage with beauty. They're the ones who are able to find joy, find awe. And the best news of all was she said, you can actually learn to be that person if you're not already. It's one of the personality oh, traits that you can and so what did you do? You went on a canoeing trip, right? Or, or very I went on a canoeing trip. I went, I went, um, I knew that I was someone who found awe and beauty in nature. Other people will find it maybe in other, other places, uh, through symphonies or, you know, through their children or, you know, wherever. But for me, I knew it was nature. And so um, I just tried every chance I got to experience awe outside. I went looking at the sunset every night. Um, I sp sometimes spent time in nature with friends. I sometimes spent time alone. I did this 14 day, 13 day solo canoeing expedition in a bid to try to find some really big awe in the wilderness in Utah. And that worked? I mean, cause you know, there is somebody camping in your head. I'm afraid they might just. Yeah, it only, it river. only partly worked. It partly worked and it partly didn't work because I was still alone and still feeling a little bit on edge in terms of my safety. Because as, as we've said, you're not really supposed to feel safe necessarily as a human if you're by yourself in the wilderness. Exactly. So I, I still had a hard time by myself for 14 days. I, I think I would go crazy thinking about it. And yeah. You know, but to, to each his own. I mean, I'm I'm very I am an introvert actually, and I I can go on an airplane for 12 hours and be perfectly happy, but 14 days in the wilderness, <laughs> first of all, I'd be scared by I'd be eaten by something. Yeah. You know? yeah and you exactly. have all other fears. But maybe that distracted you, did it? Yeah, it did distract me. Um, and I had a lot of time to work on the meditation skills. And I had a lot of time to reflect, um, which, as you say, is not always so good. I was, sometimes was too hard on myself. And mm -hmm. I didn't have my friends to pull me out of it. Um, but at the end of the experience, I also had my blood analyzed before and after this river trip. And afterwards, my immune system still did not look that much better. It still looked like the blood of a lonely person, <laughs> which oh. makes sense because I was alone. <laughs> so then, so then I had to sort of reassess what didn't work about that and and go find some awe, you know, in some other places and with other people. Um, and I, I I did different kinds of therapy sessions. I did EMDR, which is supposed to be good for trauma. What is um, EMDR? It stands for eye movement um, desensitization. Um, oh. 
And it's, it's sort of this bilateral stimulation that you do with the therapist. And it's supposed to decouple your um, emotions from your memories. So that if you're having- oh, That's a very cool. Uh, it, it, it helped. Uh -huh. it in what way did it help? Walk um, down a little bounce in your step or? No, but I felt like I had a big revelation hmm. um, through that experience, which was that I actually, I was able to see very clearly that I did feel unsafe in my marriage emotionally and that I needed to separate more from my ex Mm -hmm. in order to feel safer and in order to feel better. So it gave me some, I would say, some marching orders for moving forward. That was really helpful and important. And how about, I remember you, uh, you took some MDMA. And I took MDMA and psilocybin, also science-based for helping with trauma and helping with fear and anxiety. And I was also after- I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I was after big awe, you know, I, I wanted the awe of that kind of journey, that psychedelic journey. And it did, it actually helped a lot. It helped me a lot. That's interesting because I mean, it does drive up the serotonin system and does calm, calm, calm you. So, I mean, there is physiology to that. And you know, there's this whole new movement now of using all of those psychedelics in medicine. And so obviously yeah. Yeah. you were with somebody who, did that and did you do it a lot of times or no I, I i worked with a therapist so i did it in a clinical setting where i felt safe uh, with someone i trusted and that's really important um and uh it was kind of a, it was a one day experience but there was also some time beforehand and mm -hmm. uh, to sort of uh you know for i don't know to sort of prepare for it and to lay out kind of clear intentions mm -hmm. so it was all very it was all very sort of I would say kind of rigorously done in some ways. And then there was this debriefing afterwards with the therapist where we talked about what had happened um, and what I learned. And it was really, it was great. Were you walking and looking around or were you lying on a bed? No, I was lying on a futon with an eye mask on and listening to um, um, Benedictine chants and stuff like that. Wow. Oh, that drive me crazy. But uh, I mean, I like Benedictine <laughs> chants, but those kind of drugs make me want to walk but but anyway so now when you read your book now and you see who that person was how do you feel i think maybe that's a corny oh. question, but there's so much pain in this book and so yeah. much yeah charm so much charm somebody who's really trying to work this thing out you know yeah i do i do feel compassion for this person who was <laughs> suffering so much uh, at the beginning. I feel a lot of compassion and I feel I feel a lot of pride that I was able to finally write the story of healing and resilience. Not, you know, not every day, a hundred percent of the time. I don't think I don't think the healing from heartbreak is necessarily um, you know, complete. It's not like, you know, you put a bow on it and and it's done forever. But I feel like even when I have moments of regret and moments of pain, that you know those are part of who I am now, and I can look at them without being completely, um, you know, decentered. Mm. You know, it's so interesting because I'll walk through Central Park. I live in New York City, and I'll look at a baby in a baby carriage. And I'll think, man, you got a lot ahead of you, kid. <laughs> and then I walk, and you know, I mean, it's just so. You do live and you learn if you got any brains at all. And and like you said, it is post-traumatic growth. And I think that's a great way of of really, you know, um, focusing this that, you know, uh, and, and you come out of something better. Would you take him back if he came back to you? No. Well, I'm, I'm, nope. I'm done with it. Moving yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the opportunity to move on. It would be nice to have a, you know, a second shot. Um, and so oh, you're going to have a second shot. You're too pretty. You're too smart. You're too articulate. <laughs> you're too charming. There's going to be more than one. You have anybody online now? Or, well, maybe I don't. Want, maybe somebody's listening in, and you shouldn't be saying it. But I <laughs> um, I, uh, I am dating a very nice man right now, and so oh, terrific! I and knew you'd be happy for me, Helen. What? I knew you'd be happy for me, Helen. Oh, mm. terrific. And uh, uh, I am. And um, and you were avoiding some of the traits in the husband that 
I mean, you now know that there's certain things that this guy does not have. I've and learned so much about longer. Yeah. Exactly. I wonder, do you think we should, I, I know we may, maybe have a couple questions from the audience. Should we? We do, Christina, we do. Do you want to okay. jump in? Sure, right. here I am. So um, how did you go about forgiving your ex-husband? Is forgiveness essential and should it always be the goal? Great question, a really hard question. Um, I don't feel like I am an expert on forgiveness. I think that sometimes forgiveness doesn't happen. And I think sometimes it maybe doesn't have to happen. Um, I didn't really seek it or try to have it happen. Um, it just happened with time when, as I, I think felt a little more compassion for, you know, for him and for, for the mistakes that he made and the mistakes that I made. Um, but I don't, I don't think it always happens. And I think that might be okay. Helen, what it, what do you think? Well, about that? I, I have felt that, um, I mean, in my cases, I, I have forgiven, but you don't forget. You never yeah. forget. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 that kind of trauma. And it's adaptive to not forget so that you don't do it again. <laughs> so someone would like to know, does science point to how long it might take for someone to recover from heartbreak? Is there a length of time? Yeah. Um, I, I saw some studies indicating that it for, for, for at least the end of an average, I mean, the, yeah, the end of a sort of longish marriage, it can take about four years for your body to return to baseline in terms of your nervous system, in terms of your immune system. Um, so most people seem to recover from that within about four years, but there's a percentage of people who don't recover about 15%. And the same with um, bereavement and complicated grief, about 15% of people don't. And is there something, um, is there some factor, something that you can point to in, the, in certain people's character? Or is there something biological that, that creates that difference from a person who has resilience to a person who who does not or is overcome by their heartbreak? You know, I think all these things we've talked about seem to make a difference. The ability to tell a story, the ability to find perspective, um, to frame, you know, your tragedies in a way that you can move on from. Um, and from what I learned, this personality trait of openness, being open to new experiences, being open to beauty, being open to novelty, as Helen mentioned, um, this, these seem to be personality, a personality trait that will help you move on. And again, the good news is you can move the needle on that trait and you can train yourself to become more open to beauty, to curiosity, to experience. Thank you. Thank you. So I think, um, heartbreak, the book can do that. So I just want to rem remind everyone watching that you can order your copy here from books and books. Um, those are the only questions we have right now, but I do see people still out in the audience. So now is a good time. If you have any questions for Florence or for Helen, now is a good time to put them in and we'll be happy to, to pose them. Um, I would like to ask just, do you, you know, what's your best advice for someone who is going through heartbreak? What, what would you tell them, both of you? Um, how can they best deal with it? I have this kind of trifecta answer to that. Um, the first piece being you need to sort of calm, find some calm because your nervous system is on edge. You're in fight or flight. Do what you need to do to sort of calm down, whether it's meditation or whether it's walking or movement or nature or whatever it is. Um, and then it's only then that the healing can happen. And then the second piece would be connection. So connecting to other people, connecting to your friends, your family, and connecting to nature, for me, or beauty. And then finally, the third piece that the science really seems to support is finding a sense of meaning and purpose that will help you move on. What about you, Helen? Well, I, I mean, there's somebody camping in your head. And you really got to get them out. So I like this idea of calm, but how do you get that calm? And just as Florence said, you know, moving, keep moving. Don't sit down and let them let them start to crawl all over your mind. You know, uh, go out with friends, do novel things. You know, I, I, you know. I mean, 
um, treat it as an addiction. Get rid of the cards and letters. Don't write. Don't call. Don't show up. Don't talk about it after a while. Um, go do novel, novelty, novelty, novelty. Um, you know, I, I would say keep moving. You don't have to be, you know, running around the block every day. Just uh, explore new things, uh, new books, new articles, new movies, new friends, old friends who who uh, just love you for who you are. Just find yourself a whole pile of safe spaces and stay there, you know, and, and move on to, 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 to things that really distract you, number one, and really please you, number two. That's wonderful advice. So we have one more question coming from the audience. Um, Someone would like to know, how does the age of the brokenhearted person affect how they will react? That's an interesting one. Um, I, I'm going to kick this over to Helen because I actually have a feeling what she's going to say, and I would say the same thing. Geez, that makes a lot of pressure on me. Well, first of all, it's the basic brain system. It's like the fear system or the anger system. You're going to suffer at any age. That's right. Um, but I do think that the young with lack of experience, I don't know this, uh, Florence will know this, are more likely to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, as you get older, I mean, you now have other responsibilities. I mean, you're not going to kill yourself if you still have small children. You know, you've got a good job. More people are depending on you. You, you sort of maybe learn a little bit more about how to cope with the stress um and i think some of the young think this is it for me if it's not, if it's not this person i'll never i'll never survive so um i do think that the feeling is exactly the same at any age but older people generally are, are better at coping with uh with figuring it out what, what two, more, two more questions have popped up uh, do you feel reluctant to get serious about another man in the future? Will you have a longer engagement on the next time around? <laughs> yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good. Uh, and then once one reaction to heartbreak is to get on Tinder and jump into bed with new people. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> I got lots of them, but what do you say? <laughs> yeah, I bet Helen has lots of thoughts about that. Um, so the, the science seems to indicate that our testosterone levels actually do rise after a, a breakup. And so that's very motivating to get on Tinder. Um, and so I think it's a natural impulse for a lot of people. Not everyone. I mean, some people are going to feel like they don't feel safe doing that. And that's fine, too. Um, and I, I, I guess I would... I would say, you know, if you're going to do it, just be careful because the safety piece is important after you've been wounded uh, emotionally. Well, uh, you know, I, I don't think that Tinder is any, any less safe than walking into a bar and picking up somebody you don't know. So, um, uh, I mean, I, I study these sites. And what's interesting is there was a new academic paper that came out is if you met a person on a dating site match or any one of the others, as opposed to meeting through a friend or a church or whatever, uh, you were less likely to divorce. And I thought to myself, now why would that be? I mean, what difference does it make if you let him in, met him in an airport or met him in the grocery store or met him in wherever? Why would it make a difference? So I did my own study of 5,000 Americans of this, and I found that people who date on the internet as opposed to off the internet are more likely to be fully employed, more likely to have higher education, and more likely to be looking for a committed partnership. So I am very in favor of, of these. I mean, particularly older people. I mean, what? I, I'm too old to stand in a bar and have the perfect boy walk along, you know, uh, walk in. So the bottom line is they work. The problem is they're so new that people don't know how to use them. And what they do is binge. And the brain is not, cop of, uh, uh, is not capable of binging properly. The brain is capable of, of making, but choosing between about five to nine options. And once you get 10, 12, 25, whatever it is, you choose nobody. So if I had to say two things to people who are ready to go out and, and start again, um, the internet is a good place to do it. It's a safe place to do it. I mean, decide where you're gonna meet these people for God's sakes. I mean, if you're gonna meet them in a dark alley, it's stupid. If you meet them for coffee in the middle of the afternoon, there's nothing, no problem with it. But um, after you've met nine people, and that's either through video chatting or through uh, actually a date, when you, you got to see the person, you talk to the person, you got to see the way they move and smile, and are they interested in you, et cetera. After you've met nine people that are within your category, stop. 
get off the dating site and uh, get to know at least one of them better. That's number one. And number two, think of reasons to say yes. Um, you know, when you know so little about somebody, you overweight the few things that they say. And suddenly you realize, well, they like cats, I like dogs, it never work. Um, it, you know, I mean, I was actually having a lunch with a, a woman today and she was showing me uh, on the internet and she ran into some guy who said he didn't like uh, cilantro. And he said, well, I love cilantro. I guess we could never get along. And I say, hang on, kid. <laughs> This could work. You got to try it. Look beyond the cilantro for Christ's sake. So the bottom line is they're out there. People are looking for love. It's primordial. It's adaptable. It's eternal. We got a brain system for it. It can be triggered instantly. And these dating sites, I think, are a very good positive way to, to find love. And by the way, just as, uh, as Florence has said all along, relationships are essential, not only to happiness, but to health. It's worth looking for. Thank you. Okay, so I one more. The question. dopamine queen. I love it. <laughs> Why do you think some people are better able to compartmentalize heartbreak? I think some people are more introspective. I think some people are more comfortable, you know, with their emotions. And, um, uh, but I also think some people wallow in their emotions. So, you know, the opposite of compartmentalization isn't necessarily so perfect either. You know, people sometimes wallow too much in these emotions. So there's probably some happy medium there between being able to say, I mean, I know when I was going through this, I would cry every day, but I would only cry for like five minutes. <laughs> and then I would try to sort of move on. Um, so you don't want to ignore these emotions, but you also don't want to wallow in them. Such sanity, Florence. Isn't she great? She's so great. <laughs> Fantastic. Really? Congratulations. Congratulations on the book. Thank you for an, a, a wonderful conversation. Extremely interesting. So insightful. Uh, thanks for being with us. Thanks for supporting independent bookstores like Books and Books. And everyone out there watching, remember you can purchase your copy of Heartbreak at Books and Books below. If you're in Miami, you want to come by any of our stores, we have it there as well. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you the next time. Right? Thank you so much, Christina. Thank you, Books and Books. Please support your independent booksellers, everyone. They do such a good job and so much hard work to put these events on um, and we're all the thank better you. for it. So and thank you know what? Here, this is what I wore in your honor. Love it. <laughs> So, all right. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you.